Wanted to ask you to start off, I guess, you talk about a word that gets thrown around a lot, uh, and I want you to talk about what it means, and the word is hegemony, because a lot of things that the United States does, people say, well, it's all about U.S. hegemony, or uh, U.S. needs to be a hegemon, but what does that actually mean? Well, it's it's very similar to the idea of imperialism, except it's a little broader. If you say hegemony, it can actually apply to dominance over any particular realm. So you could say that, I don't know, Darwinian evolution is hegemonic in the field of biology, for example. Um, in the case of U.S. foreign policy and political science and international relations, which is a subdiscipline of political scientists, of science, political science, it means uh, the dominance over the globe, over the international system. And this is something that as an empire, you strive to achieve hegemony over your empire, over the area you're supposed to dominate. And so the U.S. pretty much picked this up from the British, uh, but they sort of supersized it when they became the, the global uh, hegemon after World War II. And this is, I think, been the defining feature of U.S. society is uh, this global hegemony, which has uh, really, I think, overridden all other uh, aspects of U.S. politics. And it's really, it, it's been the driving force of U.S. history now is this drive for global dominance. And so it's something everybody should should be aware of and, and, and be thinking about if they care about politics. When the United States does something or the government does something or the deep state does something, and we'll get into that in a second, and they're doing it for the sake of hegemony. Does that mean political power, political dominance? Does that mean economic dominance? Is it a combination of those things? They are all related. When you control the economic system of a, of, of a civilization, then you're going to control the apparatus that is supposed to secure that system and protect it. So under feudalism, you had the crown and it was legitimate legitimated by the church and they paid all the salaries of the sheriffs and other knights and so on because they controlled the whole economic system and where all the money and surplus of the economy went and so they could maintain themselves for a while that way and they controlled the culture that way uh you know the church was the responsible for the sense making of the time you know the earth was flat and it was at the center of the universe and the king was the king because the, uh, the because God wanted it that way. And if he if God didn't want it that way, then the king wouldn't be the king. This is kind of like the logic of hegemony. If you apply it, that's that logic to feudalism. Then it's, we can. It, it seems very clear, and it, it becomes kind of ridiculous to think to endow or to invest any of those institutions with like you know uh, legitimacy or divine sanction or whatever. When we think about our own times, we, we typically think about it differently because we sort of trust, we believe in things like the free press, okay? But the myth of the free press uh, is kind of like the, the divine right of kings. It's just something that it, it falls apart if you scrutinize it at all, but it's like, this is one of the things that we think of as uh, explaining how our civilization works. So yeah, hegemony in all these areas, culture, cultural, economic, uh, intellectual, educational, <laughs> Uh, these are these are all inter interrelated, and I think that in the U.S. case, this international hegemony over the global political economy is what underpins the uh, all of the other ways that they control, you know, perceptions around the world and everything else. Uh, this is the, so every it's all it's all it really is all related. I mean, this is a, a kind of a generic materialist perspective, but uh, I think it's it's pretty hard to argue with uh, when it comes down to it. So how does this apply in the real world? Like, let's talk about what's happening now in Russia. Um, the United States is doing what it's doing. So for someone like me, and I think like you and a lot of my viewers, right? Uh, the United States did, did not do all of it could have done to stop the invasion. As Chris Hedges says, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, he says it was unjustifiable, but um, predictable, and it was avoidable. And we've seen since the beginning of the war, we've seen the United States try to uh, 
you know, the West and the United States try to stop peace negotiations. So where does hegemony fit into that? Well, this goes into, I mean, this goes way back in terms of the U.S. and what they've really been doing since the end of World War II. Or even if you take it back to World War I, it's similar to things the British were doing. A part of the reason World War I happens is because uh, the admiralty of, uh, you know, the, the British Navy, and you've got Winston Churchill, he's in a position of power there, and they make the decision that they're going to have to go for oil and that they're going to refit the entire British Navy to run on oil because it's more efficient. And the big oil, there's not much oil in Britain. There's a lot of coal, and that helped them earlier in industrialization, but not in the age of oil. Now, there is a lot of oil in the Middle East, and Germany is building a railroad that goes all the way from Berlin to Baghdad. And this is in the years before World War I. And this would have been a huge threat to uh, the British Empire. And uh, people, more and more historians nowadays, are recognizing that this was actually an underlying cause of World War I, that this whole Anglo-Atlanticist uh, imperialism, which the U.S. has inherited, that it's been really preoccupied with the idea of Germany, uh, as a, and especially Germany combined with Middle Eastern uh, oil resources and with Russian raw materials, that if they ever became allied, that that would be a real countervailing power against the U.S. and before that against Britain. So this was uh, a part of World War One, and then in and then after World War One, you know, you have the Balfour Declaration, which gets into pipelines and other issues. I mean, this is an underlying part of of why Israel gets established. So people would think about this as maybe politically active. Uh, Jewish people who, you know, who are Zionists and want this homeland in the area. But there were elements of the British establishment that made all sorts of plans and schemes to uh, after the Ottoman Empire got gets broken up. And a lot of it has to do with pipelines and controlling that Middle Eastern oil. Um, but and this there's also this fear of Germany as allying with Russia, especially as the Great Depression hit. And this was a huge concern of theirs. This is why they back somebody like Hitler, who is a, a kind of a who's, well, kind of who is a lunatic, but he has as his main redeeming quality the fact that he it will kill all the communists. And so he's backed by uh, Anglo-American elites, you know, Tory elites, and so on, and people like John Foster Dulles, who helped to broker bond sales on the international market, which allowed for Germany to rearm. And the whole idea is to create a, uh, put a regime in there that will not allow the socialists to take over. So they have the Reichstag fire and they blame it on a communist, even though it was most likely the Nazis that did this. Uh, and they eventually attack Russia. The, they were called the anti common turn pack. That's the name of the Axis powers, the, you know, Italy, Germany, and Japan. It's the anti common turn, mm. anti communist international. And uh, it, the idea was to set them up like, to attack Russia. Or the Soviet Union. Now, after World War II, you had Europe, which was economically in bad shape. Russia was devastated. That even though they won, they lost 27 million people. They didn't want Eastern Europe to be... The Russians, the Soviets didn't want Eastern Europe to be uh, part of a bloc that only they controlled. They actually thought they would trade with Western Europe and they could have some you know, good relations with them. It's really the U.S. who decides that uh, they can't allow... The Eastern Europe, the, the communist countries to trade with the West. They they do this because they're really afraid of neutrality. They're not afraid the Soviets are going to invade. They're afraid of neutrality and that there would be trade between Europe and Russia, just like today with the Nord Stream. And so they have this document, NSC 68, which describes the dollar gap and all this prob these problems of trading uh, with the, the Russians and the problems that the Europeans are going to have. And the way they get around that is to create the military industrial complex to have a lot of money and the Marshall Plan, keeping money flowing the right way, but also shutting off trade between Europe and Russia. And because the, they just need that to, to create this capitalist world that they wanted. And that's what they've had since the end of World War II is the U.S. as the center of gravity with capital and trade going across the, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean both. Uh, and the U.S. to maintain this position of global dominance. And this has been since the end of, uh, in the 21st century, the end of the Cold War, they've been going further and further east. So going into former NATO, uh, former Soviet bloc countries with ex the expansion of NATO, 
the whole global war on terror and the Arab Spring Wars afterwards, if you look at them, these are in the same vein. They're really trying to maintain hegemony over that pivotal area between Europe and the former Soviet-dominated sphere of influence and control the Middle East as well. And this is all really about the U.S. attempting to manage geopolitics around the world. And they have they eventually did so much in Ukraine that and uh, with that it was uh, perceived as a threat by the Russians, which it was. I, I'm not going to say you can justify the invasion, but what the U.S. was doing in Ukraine with the Maidan coup, which was one of the most obvious CIA coups ever, uh, and then not allowing Minsk to take to happen and have this this war, this this attack on the Donbas. This is all to um, try to damage Russia. That was the reason the U.S. put so much emphasis on Ukraine in the first place was because it was perceived as an area of Russian vulnerability. Zbigniew Brzezinski, in his book, The Grand Chessboard, which was commissioned by the Council on Foreign Relations, the same group that planned the U.S. War, uh, global empire during World War II, before it even had won the war, uh, that Brzezinski was talking about Ukraine all the way back then in the, in the mid-90s. And it's so straightforward to understand as the, the, why the U.S. is there. The U.S. is not especially concerned about democracy really anywhere when it comes down to it, not, definitely not in Ukraine. It's The significance of Ukraine is that it is geopolitically extremely important to Russia. It's almost like as important as, say, the entire like east coast of the United States. It, it's really, you can't quite put it into an easy analogy, but it's the warm water port that connects to the Mediterranean and thus to, uh, you know, point south for Russia. And it's how it's a, it was a part of how they were able to save the Syrian government when the U.S. was trying to take that, that government down. So it's just enormously important and very provocative. And it kind of supersedes questions of justice or righteousness or international law, because for one thing, the U.S. violated international law by overthrowing the government in the first place in 2014. But also existential security is just the, the U.S. ignores international law all the time over things that are way less threatening than what Ukraine represents to Russia. So uh, people just need to understand how these things work in historical context. But most of our education and media does just the opposite.